All right, how many of you are ready for week two of the Song of Solomon? That's pretty exciting. Hey, before we jump into week two, let me just take a moment and give a shout out. Uh, Friday night and yesterday was our third Freedom Conference here at Grace. And a Freedom Conference is what happens when people go through a Freedom Group and then they end that 12-week group with a very powerful weekend. And that's what happened yesterday. 137 people went to the Freedom Conference and 79 uh, additional people served on the Dream Team serving those folks. Would you just give a big God bless you to everybody who served? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Our goal is that everybody at our church experience a freedom group and a conference. And so if you've not yet done that, it'll start again in the fall. So make sure uh, that you make that a priority. And oh, by the way, uh, our summer groups are going to start here in a few weeks. We'll start signing up, so be watching uh, for that. Okay, let's get into the Song of Solomon. We started last week. And we're following the story of Solomon and his lover and their relationship. Last week, we talked about red-hot attraction and what attracted them to each other. We talked about spiritual attraction, emotional attraction, and physical attraction in that order. The order is important. Today, we're going to talk about their courtship. Now, next week is Mother's Day, so we're going to press pause on Red Hot. And two weeks from today, we're going to pick it back up on their wedding night. And we're going to talk about red-hot monogamy, sex. <laughs> and uh, write that date down, May 19th. All right, guys, write it down. All right, and then we're going to follow up with their first fight, red-hot conflict, and then we're going to talk about how they finish red-hot forever. Okay, so today we're going to look at courtship. And before we begin, just want to give a shout-out to uh, Pastor Jeff for helping me with today's message. And then also uh, there is a message series on Right Now Media by Tommy Nelson that I would encourage everybody to check out. Matter of fact, if you've never had the talk with your kids... You say, I don't even know what to say. Get Right Now Media, sit down and watch Tommy Nelson, Song of Solomon. He'll do the talking for you, but there will be some questions to follow up, all right? I want to encourage you to do that. Now, today is a sensitive topic when we talk about sexual purity, we talk about courtship, we talk about dating, so this is a good time to remind you of the ground rules for this series. First of all, we're asking everybody to listen for you and not for somebody else. Okay, so no elbowing and yelling across the room, hey man, did you hear that, honey? No, don't do that, okay? Listen for you, not for somebody else. And this is important, especially today. I want you to listen through the lens of your future and not your past. Today we're going to paint the picture of what God wants for us in sexual purity. And, and for some, that's just not your story. You've already made some mistakes. And I just want to encourage you that you go to a church called Grace... And we didn't pick the name Grace because, oh, that sounds good. We picked the name Grace on purpose because that is our story and that's our, that's our message here is that the grace of God. How many know we serve a God who makes all things new? You may have messed up a thousand relationships, but we're going to get 1,001. We're going to get it right this time. Am I in the right church? Okay. So listen through the lens of your future from this day forward, we say in wedding ceremonies, right? Okay, so not from your past. And this is a PG-13 series. And so uh, we're, we're talking about some issues that parents need to decide if, if you want your kids to be part of this. I think it's very appropriate for 13 years of age uh, or over. But again, parents, you get to decide that. We're not going to be any more explicit than the Bible is. But Song of Solomon gets pretty spicy. <laughs> it's going to get a little spicy here today. And, and you may ask yourself, Pastor, why, why, are you, why are you talking about love and sex and relationships in church? It's because the world has it all wrong. You might not know that the practice of dating is only about 100 years old. The modern practice of dating. Before that, there was courtship. And so uh, I happen to believe that God might know a little bit more than Tinder or Nicki Minaj about love, sex, and dating. Are you hearing me today? And, and when it comes to love, sex, and relationship, here's what we want you to take away is that God's way is not just right. We're not just coming over saying, do it God's way, do it God's way, or else you'll burn in hell. No, we're saying it's better because he designed it. He's the creator of it. He knows how it works. Now, sometimes when we talk about, uh, you know, love and dating and sex and courtship and purity, I, I realize some are in the season of life. This is painful to talk about because, you know, you're a single adult and it certainly seems like everybody around you is getting engaged and 
falling in love and getting married. And if you're not careful, you feel like that piece of luggage on the baggage carousel at the Indianapolis airport just going around. <laughs> anybody, anybody want me? You know what I'm talking about? You feel bad. That's not, you shouldn't feel that way. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, you know, and some of us have, you may have family members, you go to this family wedding, and every time they look at you and say, you're next. You know what you do with that family member? Next time you're at a funeral with them, you look at them and say, you're next. <laughs> I'm only kidding. Don't do that. Now, too often, this is what dating looks like in our culture. Boy meets girl, or boy meets girl on an app, swipe right, they meet up, they go out. Uh, they end up at one of the other's house. After all, they're just hanging out. They end up kissing, and then they lay down, and then he says, why don't you stay over? And then they start doing things that God intended for married people to do. And they do this for a period of time, and then boy meets another girl, and girl meets other boy, until one day, girl meets special boy, and boy meets special girl, and they get married. But then after a time, they get divorced. What happened? Well, I think it's as simple as this. You play like you practice. You play like you practice. And can I tell you that much of what happens in modern dating is practicing for divorce. Now, why is it that we can accept this principle when it comes to athletics, when it comes to finances, or when it comes to academics? You know, if I discipline myself now, if I work hard now, you know, I'll reap the benefits later. But, but can I tell you that relationships, why is it that in relationships, especially in the area of sex, we say, hey, you're going to get tied down later, so have fun now. Sow some wild oats now. It just doesn't make sense, and it doesn't work that way. Because relationships are the most important things in your life. Matter of fact, if you'll do the right things now, you'll actually reap the benefits of relationship for the rest of your life. So do it right now. And so uh, that's why I think Song of Solomon gives us this strong warning in chapter 2. Uh, he says, promise me, O women of Jerusalem, not to awaken love until the time is right. Now, he's not saying love is wrong. He's saying there is a time for love, and he's talking about physical love. He's talking about sexual love. Don't wake it up until the time is correct. And I want you to notice that it's not just one time in these eight chapters. Three different times we have this strong warning to let love sleep. Now, uh, why? Well, because when you wake up that sexual part of you, it's hungry. And it has an appetite. And you want to try to put it back to sleep, but the problem is it's kind of like Iron Man trying to put the Hulk back to sleep. Go to sleep, go to sleep, go to sleep. <laughs> Can I get a witness in the house of God? <laughs> See, God created this sexual drive in you, and there's nothing wrong with it. God created it. God created you. And so those, those sexual uh, urges that you have, that drive that you have, God designed you to have it. Here's the deal. But he designed it for marriage. Right. Marriage first, then sex. Right. The order is important. And if we get it out of order, what God intended for good can actually end up hurting us. And this gift that God gave us can become dangerous and painful. You say, why is that? I'm going to take a few minutes, and I'm going to get a little scientific with you. And I know it's early, but stay with me, stay with me, because I'm trying to make a point. Write this down. I, I think this is simple enough that sex is powerful. And God created sex for a purpose, and he created something very, very powerful. I think the phrase that's popular in our culture, it's just sex, is one of the biggest lies ever per perpetuated on our culture. Here's what the scripture says. Love, he's talking about sexual love, is as strong as death. It's powerful. It can only be broken by death. And so uh, because sex is so powerful, there is no such thing as no strings attached sex. 
or friends with benefits. That is a lie. Because love is strong as death. Sex is powerful. And watch this. Sex is physically powerful. Now, God created sex for a purpose. He created it for marriage. And scientifically, I want to show you what happens physically between a man and a woman when they unite together in sex. Did you know that there are three hormones, three actual chemicals that are released in your brain during sexual activity? There's dopamine, oxytocin, and vasopressin. Now, dopamine sounds familiar to a lot of us. That's where we get the word dope, which tells you that sex is a drug, all right? So when you're on, never mind. Keep going, Wayne. Keep going. All right. So dopamine is what is an addictive chemical. This is why sex can become addictive. And again, it's intended to reward you. God created dopamine to reward you for pleasure, okay? Okay. And in sex, he wants you to reward you for doing it the right way, but that's another story. Oxytocin is, pr is present in females, and oxytocin is that chemical that is especially present when a woman is nursing her baby. It's called the bonding chemical. And when it's released during sex, a woman is bonded to a man. Vasopressin is what is present in a man to do the exact same thing. Now, this is why research tells us that this bonding during sex is real and is almost like the adhesive effect of glue, a powerful connection that cannot be undone without great emotional pain. What I'm trying to tell you is that God created sex as a tool to cement a man and a woman together till death do us part. Are you, here, are you hearing me today? Sex is not just physically powerful, it's also spiritually powerful. You see, when two people unite together physically, sexually, it's not just physically united, they are spiritually tied together as well. And I think this is why the Bible gives such stern warnings about sexual activity outside of marriage. Now, one of the things that we deal with in our Freedom Conference uh, each time we come together is this issue of soul ties. And it's the idea that when a soul tie is formed, it's like this invisible umbilical cord that is attached between men and women. It can either transfer life or death. And I want to show you an illustration here today, kind of how that works. Sin and evil spirits are passed through the different people who come together, all right? So there, this is David and Beth. Now, let me stop right here for a second and say what I'm about to tell you is an illustration. <laughs> It's not actually true about David and Beth. Some, about, some of the things I'm about to say about David, you're going to wonder, how are those people on the platform again? Fiction. This is fiction. Everybody say fiction. fiction. All right. Let's not start any rumors, okay? This is an illustration. So here we go. So David and Beth go to Grace. They met through some mutual friends at church. David uh, gave his heart to Jesus last year during At the Movies. Woohoo! Right? And it's never been the same. Beth was raised in church. And after a time, walked away, but she has since renewed her relationship with the Lord when she started attending Grace a few years ago. Remember, this is fiction. fiction. Thank you. So David and Beth are engaged, and they're excited about the future that God has for them uh, with God at the center. And they truly feel like God brought them together, and they want to live for God. And that sounds great, but there is a little problem. Before David and Beth met, David had other relationships in high school, in college, and over the years, he had no concept of God's plan for sexual purity, and he had sexual relationships with other women, Leah and Blanca. Before David and Leah slept together, she had also slept with Jaron. And even though Beth was raised in the church and was taught the principles of purity, like many of her friends, she, she felt pressure to her boyfriend before David, and so she and Cole, even though they were both in church, they had a secret, intimate relationship. So she thought they'd get married one day, so she rationalized the relationship, but something she didn't know was that Cole struggled with pornography. See, what I'm painting here is a very real picture of what happens when people are united together in sex. There is a soul tie between you and every person you've been with sexually. Now, let me stop for a second and say one of the things that we do in, in the freedom groups, in the freedom conference, is we're going to show you how Jesus can make all things new. And we can break 
these soul ties off of you because we don't want to bring all this baggage into our marriage. Are you hearing me? So Jesus can make all things new. But I want to show you, I'm, I wanted to show you this illustration today for students, for single adults, and say, don't even, you, you, don't, you don't want to need this. Are you getting this? I want, I want you to understand that, that, that sex has power spiritually as well. Thank you guys for being part of the illustration. We appreciate that so much. This is the part they're not telling you. But it's very real. And sex is also emotionally powerful. Uh, Focus on the family and their research says that sex is perhaps the most powerful force bonding a man emotionally and relationally to his wife. And that's why researchers, uh, these doctors say people who have misused their sexual faculty and become bonded to multiple persons actually diminish the power of oxytocin to maintain a permanent bond with an individual. You know, remember when sexual activity occurs, there's these very real and powerful chemicals that are released into your body. And a lot of those words that we put on the screen, dopamine and vasopressin, it sounds like the stuff you go to CVS and get from the doctor. You know, because it is. Sex is the first drug God created. Think about it. So, uh, well then why did God create that for marriage? Because marriage is hard. Two people become one. Oh, that's easy. Two families uniting together. And then there's money. And then there's the jobs. And then there's the kids. And then there's the stuff. You're going to need some drugs, people, is what I'm saying. (laughs) Am I the only one? (laughs) I read. All the married people said amen. That's right. You're You're going to be some conflict. There's going to be some stuff. I read one particular article that compared it to the same, having sex is the same as getting intoxicated. So you don't need uh, alcohol. You just, never mind, we'll just keep going. (laughs) So to all of the uh, married people, I have a word from the Lord. Have sex. Do it a lot. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. Amen. Amen. Some of you men are saying, I go to the greatest church in the history of the world. <laughs> yes, you do. Now, listen, because it's so powerful, it's not intended to be used in the wrong way. And this is why Tim and Kathy Keller wrote a great book called The Meaning of Marriage. And they said, the Bible doesn't counsel sexual abstinence before marriage because it has such a low view of sex, but because it has a lofty one. That's powerful stuff uh, for all of us. And because it's so powerful, we've got to use it in the right way. And look, look at what Solomon says. Solomon says, love is strong as death. Its jealousy is unyielding as the grave. It burns like blazing fire, right? Like a mighty flame. And again, he's talking about sexual love. He says sexual love is like fire. He compares love to fire. And how many know fire used in the right way, in the proper containment, can provide light and power and warmth and energy. But fire that is not contained and not used in the appropriate way can actually result in loss and pain and death. Don't play with fire, my parents always told me. And yet one particular day, I think I was about 10, We had this rule at my house, my parents did, that we weren't allowed to just sit and watch TV. Go play. And we lived out in the woods. So we just found stuff to do, if you know what I'm saying. One particular day, we're bored. We're like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? So we came up with this great idea. We're going to go over to the neighbor's house. And and, and remember, this is in the woods, so it it was a fur piece to get to the neighbor's house. Okay, and we're talking to the neighbor boy, and we're like, hey, let's, let's cut some cattails down from the pond, and let's make torches. That's a great thing to do when you're bored in the woods as a boy, okay? So we go cut the cattails down. We bring them uh, under this carport. The neighbor had a carport that was attached to his garage, which was detached from the house, thank God. Some of you already know where I'm going. Okay, so long story short is while we were trying to light the torches, somebody spilled the gas can and 
gas and flames went everywhere, uh, burning down our neighbor's uh, carport and garage, not their house, praise God. Uh, and the most vivid memory that I have of that story uh, was my brother Vance running down our driveway with gas and light, fire on his foot running like this. I mean, he's, uh, now that's a funny story, except we were never allowed to go back to our neighbor's house ever again, all right? But um, playing with fire can result in serious bodily harm and even death. Matter of fact, one of the most difficult funerals I've ever had to be part of was the funeral for two young boys. I think they were eight and six who died in a fire in their house. One of them was playing with fire. Fire is dangerous. Playing with fire can hurt you, which is why Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, there's a time for everything. And a season for every activity under heaven. There's a season for sexual activity. There's a, there's a season for physical love, but it's gotta be, it's gotta be in the right season. If you're not married, now is not the season for sexual activity because what God intended for good can actually hurt you. So how in the world do we how do we guard? How do we put how do we put parameters around our passion? We live in such a highly sexualized culture. So, some people even give up, say it's not even possible. I want to encourage you that it is possible. And God will never ask you to do something that he will not give you the grace to do it, regardless of how, how bad the culture is or how sexualized the culture is, okay? Let me give you some encouragement. I want to speak to two groups of people, very practical, and then we're going to pray. First of all, what if you're in a relationship with somebody and you plan to get married, okay? What are some, what are some parameters you can put about around your passion? Write this down. First of all, you should limit your time alone, specifically your time alone. Now, the thing is, when, when, when a boy and a girl, you know, they get together, they immediately want to spend all their time together, and, and spending time together is great, but don't abandon all the rest of your relationships. Still have friends. You still got family. Come on, somebody. Right? And what you want to do is you want to, you want to limit the time that you have alone because the more time you're alone together, and again, it's often called hanging out. Hanging out means we have no plan. We're just going to do whatever. Well, when you're alone, doing whatever leads to whatever. And fire. And burn us. Never mind. So here's the deal. You need accountability because love is strong as death, and it's not a game. It can hurt you. So let me encourage you, spend time with groups. Go to church. Serve on a team. Go on a mission trip. Do stuff with your family. Come on, somebody. Are you getting this? Limit your time alone. And this is a conversation that I have with my boys all the time. Have an ending time for the date. Right? We're doing this. We're doing this. And then it's done at a particular time. Let's go home. That's good preaching. Amen. And then limit your talk. Right? If you want to guard yourself, you got to limit the word. You can't just say, I love you. You can't just say, you're the one. You know, as George McFly would say, you're my density. <laughs> you're welcome. I've got the Avengers so far. I've got Back to the Future. I mean, I am on fire here today, all right, with the cultural references. So limit your talk. Don't go breaking her heart, right, by saying that kind of stuff. Are you hearing me today? Guys, don't be using that stuff to try to manipulate her emotions. That is wrong. We got middle schoolers telling each other that they love them. I watched a video yesterday on YouTube of millions of hits of this boy showing up at an elementary school, I think, maybe it was an intermediate school, with roses. And I'm like, you're a child. Be a child. Limit your time, limit your talk, and here you go. Limit your, limit your touch. You know, again, guys, let me, let me just help you out here. Let me coach you up. If the girl that you're going out with now is not your wife in the future, that means there's another brother out with your wife. So treat that girl the way you want that other brother to be treating your future wife. Come on, somebody. Now, the deal is, the problem is, girls, girls are good at this. They go home, they put the makeup on, you know. They're looking good and they're smelling good, you know. And, 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 and guys, you just, you just want to touch. But in the words of MC Hammer. You can't touch this. You can't touch this.
can't touch this. I'm just telling you, you go to a great church. I'm just telling you. Okay, now, what does that look like? Here, here's the deal. It doesn't mean you shouldn't date. It doesn't mean you shouldn't have any kind of physical contact. It does mean you, if you're dating for any length of time, you need to have a conversation about time and talk and touch. Are you, are you hearing me? Have a conversation. If you're adult enough to date, you're adult enough to have this conversation. And set the line. And some of you say, well, Pastor, we've already crossed the line. Well, here's what you do. Get a family member, get a friend, a pastor, somebody at church, and say, hey, we need some accountability in this area. We give you permission to invite. We give you, we give you permission to ask me about this kind of stuff. I'm trying to help you here today. This is going to help you, all right? So what if I'm not in a relationship yet, Pastor, but I want to be? You know, I want to I wanna get married. I, I want to... I want, I want. So here, let me give you some advice. Are you ready? First of all, instead of looking for the right person, become the right person. In this season of your life, it's a season of preparation. So instead of always out looking for Mr. Right or Miss Right or whatever her name is, focus on you. Focus on becoming the right person. We talked about this last week. Spiritual attraction first. Work on your spirit. Work on your character. I, I like to put it this way. I heard another pastor say, become the person the person you're looking for is looking for. That's deep stuff. So what I'm saying is grow spiritually. Grow emotionally. Right? In this season, this is a time for you to grow. And, and Solomon says it here in chapter 2. He says, the winter is past. And the rains are over and gone, and some, someday, soon, we'll actually have spring in Indiana, maybe today. But how many know in the winter, you spend more time inside than you do outside? And this is what Solomon is saying is here. He goes, he goes up until now, this is, this is about the inside of me. This is, the, this is the character. Let me use grass as an illustration. And all the grass people who like to cut their grass, we're going to start a small group. All right, because we have issues, and the issues is, are with weeds, and the way you deal with weeds is fertilizer. Now, you got to know a little bit about fertilizer if you're going to take your grass seriously. All right, I should have had Chris Canales come up here and do this for me, but he's very serious about this. But there are three numbers on your fertilizer, right? And you, you don't use the same fertilizer uh, all the time. You have different fertilizers for a different time of the year. This is now, some of you ladies, this is now making sense why he's at Lowe's all the time. Right. In the spring, you got lots of nitrogen. That first number is nitrogen, then it's phosphate, and what's the other one? Potassium, okay? So in the spring, you got lots of nitrogen because that makes everything green, which is kind of weird because then that's what happens in the springtime. Everything's green. But anyway, we do it. We pour chemicals on it. Now, in the, in the, the problem is in the spring, if you, want your, if you want your grass to look good, you can't wait till spring to start. There's this other fertilizer called winterizer. And you put that on back in the fall, September, October, November, right? And it, it has that middle number, that phosphate, that phosphorus number. Sometimes that's all that's in there. And that's intended for your roots to grow deep in the winter. And here's what happens after winter is over. Now let's go back to that verse, the previous one. There we go. Then flowers appear on the earth. And the season of singing has come. And the cooing of doves. It's called spring fever, right? And, and, and that's heard in the land. But what, the reason it happened is because there was preparation in the, in the winter. Watch this. Character first, and then, and then the joy, and then, and then the, the payoff, then the flowers, then hey! Are you hearing me today? Listen. When you get the character right and the spiritual right and, and all of these things, the, the physical is actually better. The order is important. Are you getting this? Some of you are in the season of winter. Make sure, and make sure in this season your roots are growing deep. You're growing spiritually. You're, go, you're growing emotionally. You're growing uh, in ways. So, so uh, get in a group. Serve on a team. Let your character develop. Stop playing video games till 3 in the morning. Get a J-O-B. Start tithing. Start saving. Get serious about your life. And perhaps the right person will find you. 
I'm preaching better than you're amening. Here we go. Here's your next piece of advice. Use family and friends as a strategy or a safeguard. Use family and friends as a safeguard. In Solomon's time, in, uh, in, well, let me, let me use a modern Jewish wedding as an illustration. If you've ever seen a movie or pictures about this, uh, Jewish weddings will have, uh, they will have this canopy held up by four posts called a huppa. And the bride and groom will, will, will exchange their vows underneath the huppa. And many times it's held up by friends and family. Now, just a lot, like a lot of our modern wedding practices, it actually is connected to something that used to happen in Jewish culture. And that is when a young man uh, became engaged to a woman, he, his next step was to go with his dad and, that, and the young man would build a house for him and his future bride to live in. Now, the dad would go with him because the dad would provide supervision. Matter of fact, when people would ask the groom, when are you getting married? The groom would say, only my father knows. Which explains Jesus saying, no man knows the day or the hour of my return. Only the father knows. It's totally free. All right? That's powerful stuff. One day, the dad would say, okay, son, you're ready. Go get your bride. And see, and when the son is preparing for the wedding, the bride is preparing as well by her father and her mother. And, and they are guarding her integrity closely because the greatest gift this woman could give to her husband was her purity. And when this engagement was announced, they would set on a year of, of regimented schedule of fasting. And, and during that time, the, the groom would have friends that guarded him and watched over him and protected him. And, and, the, and the woman would have bridesmaids who protected her. See, you thought groomsmen and bridesmaids were just for pictures. They actually had a purpose. A matter of fact, in groomsmen in that culture many times would wear swords to protect the groom from other people, other women, and himself. Come on, somebody. I'm trying to tell you, you, got, you need friends like that. You need people in your life. You need family and friends that will support you, that will encourage you, and that will protect you and hold you accountable. That, that's, what, that's what this practice is, is all about. So if you're in a relationship, why not invite some people into your life to hold you accountable? Why, not, why don't you get a friend, a brother, a, a sister, a, a family member, a, a, a part of your group at church or whatever, maybe a pastor and say, I'm going to give you permission to ask me some tough questions. How are you doing? How is your relationship with your girlfriend, with your boyfriend? Are you staying pure? What are you watching? What's on your phone? See, the problem, the, challenge, the problem with our culture is that we do all this in isolation and we get in trouble. God never intended for us to do it on our own. We need family and friends to support us and to help us. Because the verse goes on in chapter 2 to say that, he says, catch for us the foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards, or vineyards that are in bloom. Now, at first reading, you're like, what's he talking about? Well, anytime in the Song of Solomon he's talking about vineyards, he's talking about her body, her physical body. And he's saying, he goes, there's these foxes that want to ruin the vineyards and take something before it's ready. This verse is as graphic as you think it is. He's talking about, he's talking about losing virginity. Now, so, so he's saying, there's got, you got to put a fence, some parameters around your passion. You got to keep the foxes out or they'll steal from you what God wants to have in your life. We're all one step away from stupid. It's past, you say, Dad, don't you trust me? Mom, don't you trust me? No. <laughs> you can't trust yourself. Love is strong as death. It's a raging fire, right? So we got to be protected. We got to have people around us. Are you ready? So let's keep going. So this is a season of preparation. You need to learn to walk in love. We live in a culture that says fall in love, like you fall into a ditch or something, right? I just, I just walking down the road, I, boom, I fell in love. No, no, no. Love is not a feeling, people. Love is a decision. So you got to learn to walk in love. How do I learn to walk in love? You got to learn to serve people. Pastor, I want to practice walking in love. Here you go. Go out to the red information tent when the service is over. Say, I want to sign up for the parking team. 
And I want you to give me an umbrella. And when it's raining, I'm going to walk people in, in, out, in, out. And I'm going to get wet, but they're not going to. What's that called? That's called walking in love. Right? You go to the, you go to the nursery preschool coordinator and say, hey, I want to get involved, blah, blah, blah. What are you doing? You're walking in love. You're, you, you attend one, you serve one. What are you doing? You're learning to serve. You're learning to sacrifice. That's what walking in love is. It's good practice for all your relationships. I'm going to keep going. For, and, and, and this is important. If you're in a season of preparation and you're waiting for that perfect person, then I want to encourage you to fix all your hopes and dreams in God. Because, again, we live in a culture that says, I'm waiting for Prince Charming and Mr. Right and Miss Perfect and Miss Whatever. You know, and the reality is we put so much pressure on these people. There is not a single human being that can measure up to your fantasy of whatever perfection is, except God himself. See, Tom Cruise hurt us all when he said in that movie, you complete me. Let me quote another movie. I'm on fire today. Let me quote another movie. That is a lie. Or another movie. Liar! Liar! There's lots of freedom up here today. See, when Tom Cruise said, you complete me, he's, he's saying, I need, you to be, I need you to help me be complete. Now, the problem is, Every human being in the world is going to disappoint you at some time. And what's going to happen when they disappoint you? Are you now incomplete again? That's too much pressure. You can't put that pressure on another person. So put your hopes in God. Put your dreams in God. Trust God. And let him bring that imperfect person into your life. Come on somebody where you're going to need drugs after you're married. I'm just saying. Okay, put your hopes and dreams in God. I heard another pastor say, say this. He says, whatever you idolize, you will eventually demonize. I think that's powerful when we think about it. So God says, I don't want you to idolize another guy. I don't want you to idolize a woman. I don't want you to idolize even an ideal. I want you to worship me. Put me first. I'm going to tell you the secret to every good relationship is Jesus first. If you put him first then all these other things he's going to add to you as well. And here's the last thing, and then we're going to pray. Let Jesus make all things new. We live in a world where maybe people are here today, maybe you're watching online, and the message like this, it's hard to hear because the devil's right there whispering in your ear, you messed up, you're this, you're that, you're that. I want to remind you that we serve a God who forgives a God who heals, a God who breaks soul ties. Amen. He makes all things new. And wherever you're at in your journey, wherever you're at in your relationships, wherever you're at, whatever you've done in your past, I want, I want to encourage you from this day forward, not your past, from this day forward, follow Jesus. Do it his way. His way is the right way. And his way is better. Now, some of you may be asking, why, why are you so passionate about this? Why are you even talking about love, sex, and relationships in church? Here's why. Um, Tracy and I have been uh, in ministry a long time, getting close to 30 years. Whew. Long time. We've been youth pastors, and we've been senior pastors here for more than 20 years. Through the years, we have both she and I, we have walked with some people whose lives are broken because of this. And their relationships are just in pieces. Young men, young women who made bad decisions, married people made stupid decisions. And all you have is this brokenness. And I'm going to tell you, I'm not complaining because that, that part of that, that's what pastoring is. We we shepherd, we care, we cover, and, and, and it's an honor to walk with people through the valley. But can I encourage you, part of the reason I'm sharing this with you today is because I don't want you to get there. I don't want you to, to sit across the table from me and tell me your horrible story. I want you to do it right now. I, I want you to hear this now. I want you to see the soul tie illustration now. 
Are you hearing me? Let, let's, let's do it God's way now. It's way better. It's way better. You know, we live in a culture of divorce. Statistically, a lot of people say one out of two people get marriages end in divorce. And those statistics, statistics are whatever people want them to be. I think it's actually closer to one out of three. Uh, however, those are still bad odds. You go to the airport and they say, here comes the announcement over the speaker. Uh, one out of three airplanes are going to crash today. I'm walking. I'm not getting on that plane. You go to a restaurant and you say, uh, and you hear, there's, you read the menu, one out of three people die from food poisoning at this restaurant. That's a day to fast and pray, if you know what I'm saying. I'm not going to eat at that restaurant. So why do we accept those odds in marriage? We shouldn't if we do it God's way. Years ago, I read about a study from Harvard University. And they were studying this whole idea of, of marriage and, and divorce. And they found a group of people that the marriage divorce rate wasn't one out of th two or one out of three. It was one out of 1,578, 0.001%. And they found that this group of people, what they had in common was that they were Christians who went to church together and they prayed together on a regular basis. Translation, they put God first. God was in the center. It didn't mean they didn't have trouble. It didn't mean they didn't have conflict. We're going to talk about that in a few weeks. It didn't mean they, that, that stuff didn't happen. It meant God was at the center where he was designed to be. And his power is greater than any other thing that can happen in our lives. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes here today? I want to I wanna pray for every person here today. First of all, I want to pray. I want to pray for all the students and all the college students, young men, young women, single men, single ladies. You're in this season of preparation. Jesus, would you help? Would you help these men, these women? Lord, in this incredibly unholy culture, God, would you give them a vision for purity? Would you give them courage to make good choices? Would you help them, God, put people around them to strengthen them and help them? God, I pray that there would be a passion for holiness. And God, that recognize if I play like I practice, to be disciplined now, to learn to say no now, to learn to be different now, and reap the rewards later. God, I pray for all those that have been wounded by sexual sin, either their own or somebody else's. God, it hurts. The wound is deep. I pray that you would pour in that healing oil today and you put your arms around them and remind them, God, that you, you are a faithful God. You will never leave them. You will never forsake them. God, encourage them today. And Lord, for those that the enemy has just beaten them over the head with their past, let today be the day that they choose from this day forward. I'm doing it God's way. God, I pray for every married couple in the sound of my voice. I pray, Lord, that you would give us grace. Help us, oh God, to be godly men, godly women, to serve each other in love, to put you first, to put you at the center, your will, not my will. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you're here in this room and you don't have a relationship with God or your life is out of order, God is not the center. I want to invite you to make a decision this morning, Jesus first, God first. When the scripture says, confess Jesus as Lord, what, there's, what the scripture is saying, I surrender to you, God, you're first. It's more than just a prayer. It's more than just words. It's a decision of priority in your life. If that's you, I want to lead you in the first step of that decision, a prayer of confession. And everybody that would like to encourage those around you to pray, would you pray this way? Would you say, dear God? You're first in my life from this day forward. In the past, it hasn't been that way. And I'm sorry. I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection to save my eternal soul. Holy Spirit, would you help me? 
follow Jesus in every area of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God for those of you that have made that decision to trust Christ. Let me encourage you when our service is over in just a moment. Would you go to the red information tent and just say, hey, I pray to receive Christ today. I want to le learn more about what it means to be a follower of Jesus, perhaps getting baptized. And just go there and they'll give you a Bible. They'll give you some resources to help you in your relationship with God. Amen. Why don't you stand today? And I want to invite, we're going to do one more thing. I'm going to invite uh, our prayer team to come and stand across the front. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for anybody here today that has a need in your life. Maybe it has something to do with the message. Maybe you need to respond to the message. Perhaps you gave your heart to the Lord and you just want somebody to pray with you. Perhaps you need to deal with something in your past. You need somebody to pray with you. That's fine. That's what we're here for. Maybe you just came to church and life's hard. Maybe what Steve was talking about earlier just really resonates with you. There's just stuff. Maybe you're sick. I don't know what it is, but the Bible says that we're supposed to pray for one another. And that's what we're going to do here today. So we're going to sing this chorus. And while they sing this chorus, if you want prayer, I want you to come and find one of these leaders. And we're going to pray for you. And once everybody has come forward, I'm going to come back, give the blessing, and we'll be dismissed here today. But if you would just hold steady and give people a chance to come while we sing. So if you need prayer, go ahead and come right now. Thank you. Thank you, God. More in to you, have it all. My heart is yours. More in to you, have it all. My heart is yours. If you need prayer for any reason, just come. You as a seal. 